Okay, go back. All right, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Uh, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and it is posted onto our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can find those archives. Both the live show and the archived recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So uh, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show, um, both our upcoming shows and anything in our archives. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, uh, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products, um, anything that we think that may be of interest to libraries. Um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we are the state agency for all libraries in the state, all types. So we run the gamut of, of the types uh, of topics that we will have um, for what for different kinds of libraries. So we all have things that are for publics, for academic, uh, university college, uh, K-12, schools, museums, correction facilities, anything that's a library that's really our only criteria. We're, we're very broad <laughs> in that. Um, we uh, sometimes have guest speakers that come in from, from outside of the Library Commission, outside of Nebraska as well, um, all across the country. But we also sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations for us. And as we have this morning um, with me today is Amanda Sweet, who is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> and um, she does all of our, as, yeah, as her title indicates, techie stuff, which is kind of broad. Um, and today's show, actually, Ethics and Technology, is the is a second part of a two-part series she's doing. She's done, done, is doing. <laughs> uh, back uh, exactly a month ago on February 13th, she did a session on what in the world is emerging technology and the archive for that is available now. So um, that was the first part of this. And then today we're gonna to talk about the ethics of those that emerging technology. So if you haven't watched the previous one, you can, don't go now, watch today, right? Watch right now, <laughs> but go back and you can get the, um, the basis, the the background on what we're talking about today. Kind of an yes. overview Over, of more, what the yeah. tech is. Yeah. So um, this today's show and that one um, will go together as a two part yep. deal for us. Um, so I'm just going to hand it over to you, Amanda. Um, tell us all about what we should know about the good, bad, and the ugly. It's true. Ethics and technology, <laughs> which yeah, I get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Understandable. <Yeah. laughs> so again, I'm Amanda Sweet. And probably the first question you should ask me is, why am I qualified to talk about ethics and technology? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's probably something that you'll want to ask yourself and anyone that you're learning technology from. And the thing is that in libraries, our goal is for everyone to, be, to become qualified to talk about ethics and technology. We all use it every day. We use it and we use machine learning and things like that in ways that we probably don't even realize or understand all the time. And so that is one of my main goals in doing these kinds of presentations is to redefine what an expert is in technology. Because I studied the developer manuals for machine learning for AR core for augmented reality. And I studied the developer manual for virtual reality so I learn more about how it works mm -hmm. and knowing how it works is one of the key components to understanding whether or not you should use it. Mm -hmm. I don't expect everyone to read the entire developer manual for all of this tech. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I also did background research into the ethics in technology and human computer interaction. And I read, I did a lot of um, self-study on Coursera and through, yeah, yeah. and a, a computer science intro course through Harvard. And so it's basically, I did some background research. The reason I did that research is because 
I started looking in more into technology and felt like I was drowning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very common feeling yeah. for all of us, even yeah. those of us trying to figure it out, not even for your work or your library, but just personally. Yeah. Yeah. So when you feel like you're drowning in tech, which I'm sure everyone is, <laughs> I mean, it's hitting us at work, it's in our personal lives, it's in, it's everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. So when you feel overwhelmed, learn more. And that's what we're gonna do today. So I'm going to give you a very, 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 very basic intro into ethics. So ethics is basically it's the concept of, is what I'm doing right or wrong? It's the moral code that we use to make our decisions. And every, every ethics person you ask is going to have a different definition of ethics, a different approach to ethics, and they can make it as complicated or as simple as they want. Today I'm gonna to make it simple because we mm -hmm. have some other stuff to cover. So I'm just gonna give you a few techie things to keep in mind. And I'm going to give you three main concepts to watch out for that are going to, re to recur in several different areas of your life. So instead of focusing on just social media or just machine learning or just Google search engines, I'm going to break it down into larger concepts because those mm -hmm. concepts are going to be applied to multiple different things in your life and in the yeah. future in ways that we don't. That's very useful. useful. Yeah. 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 And I'm going to, the things to keep in mind are also going to tie into how technology affects us because there are some questions that we should start asking ourselves as we're choosing new technology and using technology now. And then this presentation is, I'm in a library, it's for librarians. So I'm mm -hmm. going to do my best to keep, to gear this tech talk toward librarians. I can't guarantee I'll be successful in narrowing it down that way all the time, but I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. So first off, ethics. This is the most simplified version of ethics that you're ever going to get. <laughs> mm -hmm. And But it's the variables that you put into this decision. It's understanding what goes into the search engine. It's understanding what goes into techie stuff. It's technology is so broad that there's no one way to apply ethics to one single aspect of technology. Mm -hmm. You just start formulating your own questions and looking at it from different angles. So my goal today is to start getting you looking at this from a different perspective. To look at it not just my friends did this, so I'm going to do it too because it got more likes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also the basis of digital literacy, which is what we're going to get to a little later on. This is what my favorite goal for <laughs> ethics. Just do good things. It's looking at the world around us see what the world is right now, and then think about what you want the world to be. And then how can you use technology to make that happen? And instead of just finding a problem, looking at your list of apps, finding a keyword that matches your problem in the title of the app and throwing an app at it, try it a different way. Try looking at it and saying, this is my problem. These are the issues that are contributing to this problem. This is the technology that will solve the issues that will eventually solve the problem. Mm -hmm. This leads me to, is tech good or bad? Mm -hmm. It's all on how you use it. It's, it's not a black and white, and yeah. it's not a yes or no, yeah. I mean, blockchain started with cryptocurrency, but now it's starting to be used to help the homeless. Yeah. I mean, so amazing things, yeah. so many amazing things coming out of that. You keep seeing something new yeah. every day. Yeah. And IBM is starting to do more research into using tech for social good. And Google is starting to do AI research for and funneling the use of AI towards social good. Because artificial intelligence is all in how you look at it, too. If you go 
to Google right now and say, how will AI save the world? You're going to get a list of stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Google and say, how will AI kill us all? You're going to get, <laughs> you're gonna get a list. list stuff, yeah. yes. So again, ethics is all in your mindset when you start out in the beginning. If you go looking for bad things, you will find them. Mm -hmm. If you go looking for good things, you'll find them. And if you try to be unbiased, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing I want people to start keeping in mind is how technology shapes individual identity. And I'm going to touch on this a little bit, but I'm also in the handout that I have. I'm going to give you more information about where this concept comes from. It's got, mm -hmm. it's rooted in psychology. It's rooted in ethnography, psych, um, anthropology. It's the study of humans and how we work and why we work. What makes our identity? What makes a person a person? Mm -hmm. And that seems like a really, really large concept for just studying technology and figuring out what you want to use. But it's part mm -hmm. of it. I mean, look at social media. It's changing the way we think so about things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it just, if try to start thinking about what you want to be as a person, how other people affect you, how technology affects you, how social media has started changing the decision making process. And I'm going to, mm -hmm. I'll use a specific example of how social media has started changing the way business leaders have even started making decisions. Oh, yeah. It's inevitable. Yeah. And this this is one of my favorite. <laughs> when your self-esteem yeah. is dependent on how many likes you get. And it just, should we really be tied into a thumbs up on a screen? It's how do we want to think about ourselves? Mm -hmm. It's nice, but don't base your entire life and your yeah. all of your self-esteem yeah. on that yeah there's so many other things yeah and that's part of digital literacy is a lot of it is who do you want to be and what defines you and that's a hard thing for teenagers that are forming an identity to do and it's just, it's, it's always kind of, going to be hard at yeah, that age. Yeah. yeah. When, when it's hard kid. at any age. Yeah. It was when we were kids and we didn't have all of this. Yeah. And now yeah. it's just another thing, another, another venue they have to deal with, yeah. with who am I and, and what am I going to, how am I going to present myself to everyone else? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that'll, this will tie a lot into human computer interaction too. Oh yeah. I mean, it all will, but and then how technology shapes society and the world as a whole. So technology is hitting us at an individual level. It's hitting us at a community level. It's It can either bring a community together or it can redefine it. It's expanded our definition of community to not just the people that are in our immediate vicinity, to the people that are in our interest groups nationwide or globally. And when you have options to go to a nationwide group or a global group, you might have less of an emphasis on your immediate community. Mm -hmm. And that community can either falter or flourish based on that. And again, that's going to be who you get involved in it and how you think about technology. And if the major organizations in your individual community are leveraging that technology in a good way to bring people in. And I'll touch on that a little bit later, but that's almost another presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that another time. Yeah. Yeah. And the dual identity of mm -hmm. Facebook and social media in general mm -hmm. and companies actually. So, you try, we actually teach this to kids in digital literacy to filter what they put in social media. Mm -hmm. We say, cast yourself in a positive light. Your future employers are going to look at this and this is how people are going to define you in your head, in their mm -hmm. head. So we are teaching people to create a dual identity. And so now the question is, who are we mm -hmm. online? Who are we in real life? And is it healthy to have this dual identity? 
And there's actually a lot of research that's going on right now. Um, uh, joint research and there's a lot of human computer interaction research going on about the psycholo like so the psychological benefits and detriments to doing this. Hmm. And unfortunately, we won't really have an answer until we have more data. It's been it's only it's, been yeah a too short a period of time yeah. to see the really really future yeah. Um, uh, effect. I mean, yeah, Facebook didn't even go public on a larger scale until it was about 2012. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it started out in just isolated universities, and then it expanded out into schools, and then it expanded out into the general public. Mm -hmm. So users like Facebook has evolved and social media has evolved, but have our privacy policies and our usage policies evolved with it. Mm -hmm. And we won't know the full ramifications of this until years from now. And it's unfortunate, but a lot of this technology is that way. And that's why it is really important to start emphasizing the humanities in this, psychology, um, anthropology, the study of humans, mm -hmm. and start incorporating this into how a technology is made. And this is, personally, that's one thing that I would want to put more into STEAM. Sure. Because right now, we don't a good place really to put do a lot of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. the H in STEAM is silent. <laughs> <laughs> there are people that want to add it. There are people that want it to be, I don't know what kind of huge long word, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think it all just needs to be connected. I mean, this is yes. interesting thinking about, you know, how you present yourself on Facebook or anywhere in social yeah. media compared to what you are really, but, and what you're just think, saying, and it just dawned on me, I mean, I've been on Facebook and I used it 2012, I thought it was like 2007, but I mean, being online with it, things, it's yeah. been so long. It's just a Actually, new place right, to have, to, yeah, in, yeah, 2000, yeah, a new place to do the same thing we always have. I mean, in real life, you don't always say everything that's going on with you to somebody. Like there are certain yeah. things you, you do tell your boss about your personal life or how you're feeling about things and certain things you don't. Yeah. And same thing with your friends and your family. There's always these levels of this is what I am. This is who I present myself to you in person. And this is who I am. What's going on really in my head. Yeah. And here's how I present myself to my mom when I call her to cry about whatever yeah. <laughs> happened today, which is different than how I, I keep myself in, you know, I'm a strong person, a strong woman yeah. here at work and I'll hold it all in. So it's we've been doing this already. It's just oh, now there's this now other it's venue, magnified. and for some and lots more people can see it. And for some reason, people think it's something totally new. The venue is new, but mm -hmm. what you've been doing isn't. You've always chosen what you'll say to somebody yeah. or how you'll present yourself to someone, whether you will, you know. And you, I do see the people on Facebook who go from who are everything is always perfect. Their kids are the, the angels of, and never do anything wrong. I'm like, yeah, no, I know that's not I true know because you. you know, I'm a, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a human being. And I understand they're sometimes bad and it's okay that you just share all the fun things. And then there's the people that are the complete opposite that are every couple of hours. It's a drama. Yeah. I just don't know why I go on anymore or well now I got this bill that's coming in and then tomorrow it's something else and it's like really everything yeah. is I mean is it that extreme yeah and and you wonder what you know is that something you would really like just say to your neighbor or your coworker? Yeah. maybe not and it is something you gotta you've already been doing this and yeah I mean we're yeah. split in two there yeah and we it's, always are yeah I don't tell everybody everything yeah <laughs> I mean, preferably no one does. No, <laughs> you, know? no you need to have that. You know? Yeah. But it just, and you're going to find that. And I think, I wonder if the yeah. the social media, the online location is because there's not another, you're sitting at a computer potentially or by yourself. Yeah. You don't see another person's real face. And, and it that, makes it easier to it. say the things that you normally wouldn't. And that's maybe where some people need to learn to pull back because... Maybe it's not the right thing to yeah. put out there because you who may see it. But there are there are some ways that that is good too, though. Mm -hmm. Like because having that di like that digital distance can also 
make people open up in ways that they never would have it before. Is, yes, and if you have some groups that you interact with, like a yeah. therapy group or a group of friends that yeah. it's in a little private room or location that is, I couldn't say this to anyone else, yeah. but you guys will listen to me. And or I know the people who I am friends with on Facebook will help me through this deal yeah. and either support me in whatever's going on or will um, smack me up the high side of the head, which is what yeah. I needed. It's a yeah. good thing. And tell me, stop it. Don't do that. You know that's not right. Yeah. Go and do the right, you know. Um, that maybe that is easier just for some people not to say to a person in, in person, but to say online and get that interaction yeah. instead. So it can be helpful, yeah. See, and this right You've here. You've got to be careful about who where you're doing it. Yeah. And this right here, it's an ethics discussion. <laughs> exactly, yes. It's is this right or is this wrong? Mm -hmm. And there's it's going to depend on the application. Mm -hmm. It's going to depend on the application, yeah. the situation who you're dealing with yeah it's it's heavily nuanced and it's going to be different for each different person and each mm -hmm. different group and each different if you're using social media for personal life or if you're using social media for your business exactly a lot of people have merged because it kind of evolved mm -hmm. that way and it just and there are a over. lot of people that have totally separated it yeah there yeah. are people whether it's a, um, allowed in this terms and conditions or not have you know. multi two uh, Facebook profiles. Yeah. One is just for my family and friends, and one is for my yeah. work professional face. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's almost a triple identity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you can keep track of that. Yeah. <laughs> and so let's go on here. So these are the three main concepts that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to use these three concepts using two main examples. Google and Facebook, because those are the two main things that librarians use in an everyday life. And in the previous session, I talked more about blockchain and artificial intelligence as a whole, and I dove a lot into machine learning. And I'm not going to touch blockchain as much today because it's less of an, it's more unknown. And mm. it's not something that librarians are going to use on an everyday basis right now. It's coming. But libraries are starting to yeah. investigate it. Yeah. Maybe for a future presentation. Yeah. But hopefully our community will. <laughs> but possibilities. Anyway, so user experience design is people who study other people to decide what makes them tick. What will make them click on your website? What will make them use your product? What will make them feel good about spending a lot of time on your site? And you'll notice that I talk about this a lot in a digital sense, in a website sense, but it's used a lot in product design. It's used in pretty much everything. There's another link that I'll put in the handout that'll give you a bunch more information about what that career field is and what that concept is. And that's a whole other field of study. Oh yeah. It's used in library science a lot and that's the example that I'll use to describe it. Um, when we do collection development and we're trying to decide which books we want to use in the library, we do a community needs assessment and we mm -hmm. figure out what which different professions are in the library, what the interest of the community members are and what people actually need. Mm -hmm. And then we try to gear our library collection towards that. And then we also try to add in a few things that could be helpful information for those people to have. And so we do that already. And we also, when we build a library website, we track which sites people go to. We track, sometimes we track how long they spent on there. We, mm -hmm. can, we can track we a lot have. of stuff. Yeah. And it depends on what you track and how you use it. And that'll feed into statistical analysis. And that's a lot of what Facebook uses when they are, that's, that's like their life. But machine learning, the basis of it is stats. It's, it's stats, it's math. Mm. It's trying to identify a problem that can be solved in a quantifiable way. And so when you're trying to apply that to a human problem, 
like an example that I like to use that is re rather controversial. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Is, <laughs> yeah, yay. <laughs> you know, that, so they started trying to apply this to determining court cases. So whether a person oh, goes to jail to sit out and wait for their court date or whether they're able to go home. Hmm. And so they tried hmm. to figure out the different factors that go into a judge's decision about making this case, quite literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they tried to build a machine learning model that replicates those factors. And hmm. it's having mixed results. Did it work? I was going to say, yeah. I'm wondering, is it accurate? And yeah. that's where you get into hmm. biased algorithms. Uh. Because if you're African American going into this model, will you have a more likely chance of going to jail to wait out your time? And they also ran into biased algorithms with Amazon. Mm. Um, I'll finish this example before I use the Amazon example just to <laughs> keep them separate. But so there was a huge controversy over whether that machine learning process should be applied to court cases because that is it's an extremely complex human decision it is it's very yeah going to be very subjective to yeah. people's each person's personal view yeah of it yeah and how can you quantify that mm. and is it something that is clear cut enough that stats can solve that problem yeah and that example gets more complicated depending on how deep you want to dive into it. But that'll just, that gets you started thinking about it. And they're, I mean, they're also using it in New York to start identifying where crime happens and start doing crime stopping. Mm -hmm. Like they were trying to find out, they were starting to get some clogged drains in different areas because restaurants were dumping grease down into the sewers. So they, I don't even do that in my own kitchen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they, so they started doing a stats analysis for different restaurants that use the large enough quantity of grease that would have been used, that would have clogged up the drain. Mm -hmm. And then they used a location analysis to determine which restaurant would have been nearby enough to have been the cause of that. And then based on where the water was going and how the street flows, Mm -hmm. They determined the most likely restaurants to be the culprit, and they had a 90% success rate of identifying the restaurant. Wow. Okay. And so it can well, work. Yeah, that's something yeah. that's less subjective. I mean, yeah. it's it's all just water flow and logic yeah. of, well, if this was this, then this. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. So the thing is, when we're... When it didn't involve we're, people. Right. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah. And people are nuanced they can be an unknown entity and that's why if you look at i forgot to put this in the handout but if you look at wolfram language mm -hmm. wolfram language is one of the languages that goes into the machine learning algorithms that are used in siri and in like the natural language processing mm -hmm. but the only aspect of wolfram language they use is in stats and math mm -hmm. because that's more clear cut yeah but Wolfram language also dives into more psychology analysis. And Wolfram language is trying to pre-build a lot of this decision process into the original algorithm. Mm. And so is that going to be helpful in creating the algorithm? Possibly. Mm. Or will it further obscure the factors that went into the model? And it's, it's a toss-up. Yeah. And anyway, I go on tangents about machine learning, but we only have so much time. <laughs> yeah. so. Um, oh, so there's a question of that. Oh, yeah. Wol the language, Wolfram language, when that well, what's to what you're saying? Oh, um, W O L F R A M. Yeah. Wolf um, you can get it for. It is a pre a paid program, but if you get a Raspberry Pi, it is free on there. Mm. If you see Matt, if you get a Raspberry Pi, load it, go to the Linux homepage, you'll see Mathematica. Mathematica is one of the language that's tied in with Wolfram. And Wolfram is a whole other entity. Um, 
Do you want to add that to your handout? Yeah, I can yeah. add it on okay. there. All right. Yeah. So, um, and she's uh, um, Amanda's been mentioning the handout. Yeah, she's um, the, these slides, and she has a separate handout with all the details of what she's talking about. Um, will be available to you guys afterwards. Yeah. So that information yeah. will be on there as well. Um, this uh, our previous session last month had the same thing. We had the slides we posted afterwards, and then a more detailed handout that has links to. Um, all the different concepts and ideas and um, useful things that she's yeah. uh, talking about today. So, and if you go, I'll put the so Wolfram is really overcomplicated. So <laughs> the one that I'm going to send you to is the Wolfram demonstrations, and the Wolfram demonstrations is a more user friendly mm. kind of intro to it that will give you. There's um someone applied psychology principles to rock paper scissors. Yeah, <laughs> and they, you know, so that's kind of a sure. cool way to learn how AI works and how you can build a data set just of playing rock paper scissors digitally, mm -hmm. so the computer learns the decisions that you would make, and then by the fiftieth time you play it, the machine should be beating you. And you can go through a, a bunch of those different demonstrations, and you can learn more about how linguistics goes into AI and different things like that. So it's cool, but yeah. yeah. And big data, you'll find everywhere. Um, big data is basically, it's defined by the sheer volume of data that is available. So when you go onto social media, when you go onto Facebook, Facebook is collecting a lot of stuff oh, about you. Yes. And that data has to go somewhere. And then it has to be analyzed in different ways. And it can be sliced and diced and interpreted in every way under the sun. And so that's my, this is just my little sample slide of what we're gonna go over. So I'm gonna skip ahead because I spent way too much on that, way too much time on that last slide. I apologize uh, for sorry, that. Sorry, I got chatting. <laughs> yeah. But so I'm gonna demonstrate user experience in just two quick slides here. Cool. So this is Facebook. Facebook helps you connect and share with the people in your life. This is ethics at its greatest. According to them. <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> addictive. <laughs> so it really depends on how you look at it. And when you look at different websites, start looking at how they present themselves. And then if you look at how a company presents themselves, look again at the decisions they make because we pay attention to what makes the headlines. Mm -hmm. We don't always pay attention to how they make their ethical decisions internally. How would we know? And so this is an example that I like to use. Think about how Facebook is using our data. Cutest little mm -hmm. baby you'll ever see. <laughs> but let's Take a look here. <laughs> Facebook has been more or less studying us. They look at different keywords and they look at people who have had kids. Mm -hmm. And this is in a section called Facebook Insights. This is on Facebook's mm -hmm. marketing page. And this is what businesses that are trying to get us as users to click on their ads. So Facebook has sliced and diced our data to show marketers how to better target us as individuals. So and this one specifically, whether yeah. you do have children and don't and how things change from. And it shows how priorities change and it shows that parents, early parents, they go online more. They're, I mean, they try, they're trying to find out what in the world they're doing. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so we're, like we as users are online and we're posting baby pictures and we're posting, I mean, I've never had a kid, so I don't really know, but. <laughs> I have friends I mean, who have, yeah, though, I yeah. see it, yeah. I've, I have a bunch of friends who've had kids. And, and it's interesting, I have a friend right now who's, um, and that you're mentioning is that early parents, so you're talking like before their, their first kid, they go online and do this more yeah. than when they have a later kids. They track the behavioral changes. Mm -hmm. 
I can see that. I've got friends who have one and then a second. And I remember, because it's only been a few years, the first yeah. baby, it was all over the place. And then the second one, they're like, yeah, this is what she's doing today. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, I almost forgot that there was a yeah. second one. <laughs> and they're just a little bit more um, yeah. laid back about it. They, Like you said, they're trying to figure it out. They've figured it out, so they don't need to be on as yeah. much. And so Facebook collects all this. And they say they give their potential marketers pretty much everything they need to know about user behavior so that they can target their product to us as individuals. So is it genius on their part? Yeah. Yeah. Is it mildly creepy to the people who just had babies? A little. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at their series and reports and their insight section, you'll see a lot of these different sections. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different experiments that Facebook has been found to do on people. Um, so Facebook occasionally changes the way they put their feed out to people. Mm -hmm. And they've actually done a, a mood experiment to find out if different kinds of statuses affect your mood, like if other people's statuses affect your personal mood. Oh, so the sure. way they did this was to, they filtered in, they chose a sample size and it was about a little over 600,000 people. And they would feed in only good statuses from their friends to those people. And they just chose it based on keyword and, you know. And then they found out that the people who got fed only good statuses started putting out positive statuses. Of their own. Yeah. Sure. And then the people that got negative statuses, they either did not post or they put out negative statuses. And so Facebook has been doing different, like these little mini experiments and some are just mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, that makes sense from a marketing standpoint. Mm -hmm. And others are like, why in the world would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and some of them make the headline, some don't. Mm -hmm. And the thing here too, this, all of these information reports, this isn't something, this is all public. This is all public. What we're looking at yeah, here. Yeah, this isn't public. like only this is some we logged into something special and we only have access yeah. for some reason. No, I mean, anybody is, can go and see that this is, they've been collecting this and, and yeah, I mean they tell making it into a presentable. Here's how things yeah are affecting people. I mean mm. they tell you yeah. like they oh, yeah. we signed all this away when we mm -hmm. signed up, but we just don't. And if you have a Facebook page, you know, I know because I run a few, I run one for Encompass Live, they're always pushing to check your in insights. Here's yeah. where you, for yeah. your own particular page, can get data Yeah. on what people interacting with your page are doing. Yeah. And what we can do with that, I don't know if I have the experience or the knowledge yeah. to do as much as what they are doing. And I do not have as big a sample set, of course, um, as... Six, I don't have 600,000 people who like um, Encompass Live, unfortunately, but um, what we do have those insights um, out there, yeah. Yeah, and it's just, mm -hmm. I'm not saying this to vilify Facebook in any way. Google does it to an extent, mm -hmm. libraries do it. I mean, oh, yeah, we, yeah. The, what you're talking about, both, the community yeah. needs response. You are studying your community or even asking them voluntarily to. Uh, to do surveys or focus groups or something. Yeah. Oh, that's a voluntary thing on for the purpose of. But you do watch, you know, get statistics on what is being checked out, what yeah. isn't being checked out, um, what's going on in the community that I know I need to respond to at the library yeah. as a service or something we need to expand our collection in because something has changed in our community. Yeah. And you're doing that sometimes without talking to the people directly, just noticing what's going out, on out there. Same thing that Facebook is doing it, yeah. but at a um, more analog, I guess yeah. is the way of describing it, but it's the same concept, yeah. And and also libraries, we could do it through Internet of Things by starting to track the different section that library patrons frequent at different parts of the day. Oh yes, and so, there is actually work being done in that. Um, yeah. oh. I forget which library or set of libraries it is, but it's, they're doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's just this, all of this data can help with user experience design. 
it can help learn it can help us learn more about our our brand it can help us find out what people click on what people like how to tailor our product to what people need and we can do that in an awesome way or a nefarious way depending mm -hmm. on how you think about it and it just so what do you look for in a company that says I trust this company and do we want Facebook to be a centralized source for all of this data and are they treating it well well, they just had that Cambridge Analytica thing not that long ago that compromised a lot of our data. And that made people look at Facebook in a more negative light. But maybe they'll do something with more social good and start changing their branding a little bit. And maybe we'll start to look at their website and like them more. Mm -hmm. And But are the underlying decisions, are the processes actually in our favor? Or do the user experience people just know what we want? So I don't mm. like the last thing that I want to do is to vilify a lot of companies by doing this because a lot oh. of people are doing awesome things. They're benefiting. You're benefiting from it. I mean, it's like, something to to think about too. I mean, ethics as far as what you're doing when you're putting stuff out there, but you as a user as well. Yeah, and that's something that I have. I've had discussion with this over the years as more of this social media type stuff has been happening. It like yeah, the creep creepy factor. You said if they collect all this information about parents yeah. and their babies, but then it then pushed out to some of these parents particular ads for things that they might actually need. Oh, yeah, and it may be creepy that hey, how did they know I needed a new double stroller? Yeah, be, rather than my old one, whatever. But you know what I do? Let me check and see. Mm -hmm. This ad popped up that was totally relevant to me. Yeah. It's relevant. That's the whole thing. That's the good part about it. But some people still have this ethical conundrum of, but how did they know? Well, exactly. They yeah. knew because you gave them the info, whether you knew you were doing it consciously or not. Mm -hmm. And is that giving up that privacy worth what you get back yeah. as, as a user? And is as a library collecting that information, worth it to, I don't want to use the word invade, but <laughs> you know, take the, invade the person your user's privacy to help give them more of what they want. And we also get free access to Facebook and Google. Yeah. And ads are, the re are generating the revenue that give us free mm -hmm. access to these sites. Well, I should put an ad blocker on yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but see, and that's an, I, I have this thing where I try and balance too. I, and some people are all about, I'm not going to go on Facebook. I think it's evil. I don't want to get them to have my information, da, 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 and I don't want it. I'm like, yeah, you have to decide, am I willing to give up a certain amount of that to get the benefits, though? Yeah. And I am. I put certain things out there, and then when I get the ads, I'm like, like I'm getting lots of ads for things I've been searching for outside of Facebook come in that I see, you know, build in, and I'm like, and then I, it works. I've accidentally, not act, on purpose, clicked on some. It's like, oh, that's interesting. And then more of that same topic come up. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, that's because I clicked on that a couple of times two weeks ago. And we also have choice as to whether we click on the ad. That's true. Yes. And it just, and these ads. And I have, so I know why it's happening. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And we have control over the privacy settings on our accounts, too. Exactly. That's the thing, too, that I think is important is, too, that we are gathering information and doing things out there as a library trying to get information but the individual has really the control sometimes yeah. they don't realize it or they are still they are so up in arms about it that they just want to yeah. rant and stomp their feet and, and yell yeah. about it but you can control what you what's being taken from yeah. you what they're collecting what they're sending to you you yeah. have that at control actually you just have to go in there and find the spot to do yeah. it um, that's a whole different discussion we're here trying to talk about yeah. libraries and what we do with our there's actually a link on their privacy yeah. policy on here about how you can change it mm -hmm. how oh, do yeah. I manage and delete info about so yeah this Facebook actually had to change their data policy and they really adapted it a lot after the Cambridge Analytica thing mm -hmm. it did oh, it yeah. used to look like that but and now you'll see the format here looks really similar to Google's format mm. Um, I don't think I pulled that link, but it's it's 
Yeah, and the other thing is Google calls it a privacy policy. And then shortly after that, um, Facebook calls it a data policy. So mm -hmm. Facebook's emphasis is less on privacy and more on data collection. Mm -hmm. And Google, their user experience designer, decided to emphasize privacy. Yeah. And again, that's just branding. Mm -hmm. And then Google also started doing more into applying AI to the world's biggest challenges. And this is actually one reason that I like Google. And is Google putting this together just because people were freaked out about Cambridge Analytica? Maybe. Mm. But they still did it. Yeah. They and it's a good thing. I mean, a good thing came of a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> we'll say again. And a lot of the a lot of companies working in social media, AI, machine learning, big data, they learn from other companies' mistakes. And that yeah, is the that's biggest good. yeah. That is one of the biggest things with emerging tech is that it did not exist until not too long ago. We don't right. have the information yet to know whether it does or does not work. And we as users have almost a responsibility to find to learn more about how it works and us we as librarians have a responsibility to tell people about this yeah and to show people that part of digital literacy is knowing that you have access to privacy policies and that there is a benefit from taking the time to at least take a gander at it and knowing that you can also use a lot of the principles that Facebook laid out in their insight section to your own community and to your own personal life. Because the way that Facebook lays out really well how they lay out their user experience design and how they slice and dice their data, they more or less tell you the factors that go into it. and. If you read more about it, you can start applying this and the information from Google to your own community problems and your own personal problems. Mm -hmm. So it's very useful. Yeah. And so it's all, this is why I say change the way you think about it. You can think about Facebook like it's evil and it's doing like all these horrible things and then we should never use it like this. I put this slide together because it vilifies Facebook. Mm -hmm. This is user experience design. I want you to think that Facebook is a horrible thing. And it was a bad thing. Does it work? Do you think for yourself? Or do you let me tell you what to do? This says that I like Google. Mm -hmm. This link will send you over to Google's data policy. Our data helps build a better future. That is the quote that Google, that Google uses. Mm -hmm. According to this, Facebook is horrible. Google is awesome. Yeah. Is it? You could totally swap those. Yeah. Those quotes. I mean, those, I, for each uh, service, however you want to present it and think about it. Yeah. That data policy, that link is not titled. It doesn't say Facebook data policy. Hmm. It just says data policy. It could be anything until you click on it. That's digital mm -hmm. literacy. So we have some, some comments here about this too, I'll, I'll mention. Um, someone here says that they I give an online privacy and security course and I always tell them to at least look at it and know it's there, the privacy policies. To yes. Know, to know yeah. that they're there, that that's part of using this these services. Yeah. If you're especially if you're attending going one of these online privacy courses, you're obviously already concerned. Yeah. And if you're here, you're yeah. probably already concerned about what am I, should I be doing or should I be paying attention to? Go ahead and look at them and see yeah. what they say and that will help inform you about what each of these services are doing and then what you as a library can be doing from yeah. your side. Yeah. And open up a discussion. Mm -hmm. Start asking people questions and start people thinking about this kind of stuff and asking themselves questions internally. Mm -hmm. Because one single, one hour in a library is not necessarily going to change a habit. No. It it's going to be an ongoing thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's neuroplasticity that says that it takes a really long time. And 
I'm not going to talk about neuroplasticity because <laughs> we only have how long? A few more minutes. Five okay. minutes, but we started a little later. That's okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, she says here the first step to protection is information. Yeah, and that goes for anything libraries do. That's yeah. great. Um, and talking about specifically, it's in a, a funny comment here earlier too about um, have the your data being out there and getting things in response. Yeah. Um, this person says, I get coupons for chocolate close to a certain time of the month, and I use that example all the time. For me, it's worth it. So I always say to look at both sides of the coin. So somewhere out there knows that from whatever this person has put online, this is the time of the month you might be wanting some chocolate in your life. Here you go. <laughs> and they've tracked that somehow to know that. <laughs> so you're not wrong, Facebook. Yeah. You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. You're not wrong. Thank you. You have a lot of control of the online of the information you give online. Yeah. And that is one quick example that I do want to go over is thinking about how you make decisions based on Facebook. So in this insights, they also talk about they segmented out their different target audiences. And one of them, oh, there's actually decent examples in all of these. And they changed their people insights for today, so they no longer have that one featured. Um, I'll just mm -hmm. summarize it. Um, they did a more or less a study on media exe um, business executives who are most likely to be decision makers in their company. And they use mm -hmm. that based on self-reported titles that go into your Facebook account. And then they studied the time duration that people spend and when they spend on Facebook and discovered that a lot of people are using Facebook likely during work. And they also post things that are related to some of the decisions that they're trying to make. A lot of them probably mm -hmm. aren't in so many words, but they are trying to gather input from their audience. And then Facebook started using this information to to encourage businesses to market their specific product during the day and market the product that is likely applicable to the business executive's decision making. So that while they're already on the mindset of making this decision and they're gathering input from other people, they can creatively place ads that may sway or change someone's decision. And so now their Facebook is aware that they can change people's behavior. Oh yeah. And so if Facebook ever puts out a headline that says, Oh, we had no idea, <laughs> go to this. <laughs> they know. <laughs> it's just stay informed. Mm -hmm. And somebody has a comment while we're on the screen here, which is interesting. That middle one right there, um, why stories um my stories is a format that can help marketers promote brands. This is your Facebook stories. And so it makes a very astute comment. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. uh, doesn't, but um, interesting that stories help businesses promote man, promote brands works for libraries too. Yeah. That's one thing that comes up all the time with advocacy for your library is what is the story you yeah. want to tell? What stories are you gathering and then you want to share to promote more about your library? Yeah. Facebook stories is a format to help. Yep. And when you're building an online presence, what story do you want to tell about yourself? Mm -hmm. What story do you want to tell about your company? Yep, about your library, yeah. I mean, marketing, half of it is your story. Go libraries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to skip ahead a few through these because I already covered part of them and we're running low on time. That's okay. We'll go as long as it takes to get through all the basics that we need here. Yeah. Cool. So basically... The whole thing is about who should we trust and who is playing on fear to get what they want. And that is something that having the right information can help us determine. And it's also going to be the mindset that we go into looking for that information. 
Because again, remember I said, if you Google how will AI save the world, you'll get a different information set than you would if you Google how will AI kill us all. Yes. <laughs> um, so when you send library patrons out on a research spree to find out, to start thinking about this stuff, think about how you phrase it too. And if someone walks up to your reference desk and says, I'm looking for more information about how AI can be harmful, start asking more questions and mm -hmm. say, we have some information about how AI can be harmful, but have you thought about how AI can help too? Mm. Or what are, well, for what purpose are you looking for that yeah. particular yeah. viewpoint? Yeah. Yeah. And then you might be able to create a more unbiased look. And anyone who's ever been in collection development knows that being unbiased is virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. But we try. We try. Yes, to get as much in your collection as you can that it will show both yeah. valid sides. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we may not like it as individuals, but it's still, we have to put the information out there. Mm -hmm. It's in the library code of ethics. Mm -hmm. It's in the handout. <laughs> <laughs> and American Library Association also started putting out a social media code of ethics too. Mm -hmm. They drafted one out in early January. Mm -hmm. cool. But I, it's pretty recent, so I don't, I just stumbled upon it a few days ago, so I don't know how many people have really Hmm. dug into it. So I talked about a lot of this already. So digital literacy came up intermittently. And that's just keeping people informed about how things really work and thinking for themselves. And that is probably, digital literacy has become a monster of a thing. It's everywhere and it's heavily nuanced and it's everyone defines it in a different way and everyone's adopting it in a different way. So I'm just going to simplify it here. Learn the main concepts and think for yourself and think about what you want yourself to be and what you want your community to be and what you want the world to be and then start acting and choosing technology in a way that will help you do that. Easier said than done, but it's a starting point. And makerspace ethics I put in here because we are giving people the power to create their own things. Mm. We are telling people we have a bunch of stuff that you can come into the library, you can make whatever you want and you have we are empowering people to create, and that is amazing. Mm -hmm. Are we empowering people to create with purpose? When people come in and they're starting to choose products and they're starting to spitball ideas back and forth, do we have anything out there that'll say, create a project for good? Look at what you're friends are, what, look at what the problems in your community are, look at what the problems your friends are having, look at your problems. How can you solve them in a productive way and how can we put the tools in the library to make change for good mm -hmm. instead of just saying, here's a free for all, good luck. Have fun, make something cute, make yeah. a, make a, yeah. yeah. And which is cool make a coaster too. for your grandmother. Yeah. That's great. Once you learn how to do those things, now what more can you do with yeah. it? Go beyond just I made a cute coaster for my grandmother. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and instead of just building a website, build a website for good. If you're going to teach people HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, that's also a building block for building apps. And building apps is a building block for augmented reality. It just, what we're doing in makerspaces could progress to a lot more things. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, we have to encourage people to go through a really, really heavily nuanced learning process. And the reason that I personally haven't actually gone down a lot of these learning paths is because there's no direct 
reason that I need to as a librarian. Mm. It's just, what is the most productive way that I could use an app and then what is the most productive way that I could use augmented reality to do good for my personal life and for librarianship? And granted, after I've done this research project, I found about 20 or 40 different ways that I could do that. So <laughs> now probably, that you look for, look yeah. for it, there it is, yeah. yeah. But before that, I had no idea. Before I started researching more about this, probably a couple of years ago, I had no idea. And it just, so I had no motivation. And I could say more about this, but that is also another, almost another presentation <laughs> in itself. And so big data is going to be appearing in more and more libraries. It's somewhat it already does. Mm -hmm. But so libraries could also use the big data that's being collected by social media. And the big data, some, pro some probably are already. Their user experience is becoming more popular in every industry, and it is becoming more popular in librarianship too. So the information is out there, but what do we want to use? What do we have the budgetary resources to use? And how much time do we have to do it? And a lot of the stuff that exists out there right now can help libraries and nonprofits, but there is a cost gap. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the biggest things that we as librarians would want to help with is reducing that digital gap, that digital divide. So right now we're focusing on robotics and computer science. What about everything else? And I'm sure some libraries out there are focusing on this in some way, shape, or form as well, but who's to say? So I guess to leave you on a good note, just learn more and think about what you can do for good. Welcome to ethics. <laughs> Um, we had mentioned earlier, uh, we talked about um, measuring how people are using your library building, and I said, you know, there are people doing that, like, how we talked about what we think, they're, what they're checking out, but, like, how are they physically using the space, Yeah. and how to track that, and the ethics of that, of course, is the thing, you know, where they're going. Um, and I know there's a thing, um, Jason Griffey is a researcher and librarian who has this uh, project, Measure the Future. Um, whether you can just look that up, measurethefuture.net, and this is actually a, a product that they're doing where they are tracking um, where people are using, how they're using your library, the number of visits, what they browsed, what parts of the library are busy during which parts of the day, so physically, you know, um, using open hardware sensors to collect that data and then get that to the libraries, and, and there's a lot of information on the page about um, the privacy of it and how they're using it and everything, so that's something, another thing that's being used, and really cool pictures here of here's where the little dots where the people were yeah, I saw some of those. and how it's all um in anon anonymized anonymized yes yeah um so their goal is to enable libraries and librarians to make tools that measure the future of library as a physical space and it's open source tools open source software tutorials and everything in here so that's something too that i'm sure they had a lot of discussion there about yeah. the ethics of we are tracking who's physically coming into the building um, and then putting it together using Google Analytics type yeah. resources to figure out, well, they keep going over here, let's figure out why. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe we need more resources or just whatever you need to do to arrange. So um, that's something good, I think, to take a look at. And building a smart community, there's a lot of, it, it can do a lot of good, but there's a lot of controversy about collecting the data that they need to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But do we have any questions? Yeah, do we have any other questions? Um, anything you want to ask? Um, you can type it in the questions section. Amanda will ask your, answer any of your questions, elaborate on anything. Go ahead and type it in. Um, we had some good questions and comments throughout the show. So that was good, yeah. Um, and I think this was a great, like I said, this is a two-part series here we did on this. Uh, maybe there'll be something else in the future, but for now, this was our 
you know, emerging technology set <laughs> uh, last month, uh, the February 13th one, as I said, and then today's. Uh, when this is uh, the archive for today is ready, we will have links to both of them back connecting to each other. So you can you know, watch the first one and this one um, together um, as you want you to get more information about um, emerging technology in general, which was the first session, and then today's ethics discussion. Uh, the slides will be available out there. Uh, the handouts handout will be available as well yep. to you. And I'll add that Wolfram. The Wolfram link. information will be added to it, yep. All right. It doesn't look like anybody's typing in any more questions now, so I think uh, we could probably wrap it up officially. Cool. Works for me. All right. Thank you, Amanda, for being here with me this morning. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I'm going to pop over to our... Oh. Ah, there's a lot of thank yous. Of course, as soon as I say something, <laughs> I see this little notification come up. They're typing things. Thank you for your presentation. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, let's get you out of Thanks here to a regular <laughs> website. Just... Uh, and we're just going to do a type in Encompass Live for me there. So um, that will wrap it up for today's show. Uh, Encompass Live, you can use your search engine of choice. And um, <laughs> so far, Encompass Live is the only thing called that on the internet. So don't anybody name your something this. Um, we, all, we come up as the only search results. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Today's um, archive will be on our page right here. The scroll wheel is not really working very well. This is it. Ah. Right underneath our upcoming shows is our archive shows links. And um, this is where um, at the top of this, the most recent ones are at the top of the list. So today's show will be there probably by the end of the day today, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Um, and you'll see here we have what in the world, here's the previous one, what in the world is emerging technology. It'll be the same kind of thing. We'll have a link to the recording, link to the presentation, and the handout that um, Amanda has put together. Um, everyone who attended today and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. Um, we'll also push it out to our social Social media as we've been talking <laughs> we have Twitter and uh, Encompass Life has a Facebook page um, but while I'm here also show you this is our archives for the um, all of the history of Encompass Live going, Live going back to the beginning Encompass Live premiered in January 2009 so we do have our um, archives here going back to the very beginning. So there will be, if you do see, we do see we have a search feature here so you can search for just the most recent um, 12 months worth of info or all archives. So just pay attention when you are going through the recordings here um, of the date. Everything is dated of when it was originally broadcast. You will find old information here, outdated information, um, potentially links that no longer exist, services that no longer exist. Um, but we're librarians. This is what we do. We archive things and save them <laughs> for posterity, so they will always be on here. Um, and as I said, we do have a Facebook page for the show, and I've got links here to that. So if you are big on Facebook, give us a like over there. Um, we do post uh, announcements of when um, our recordings are available and the shows are coming up. Facebook is very slow. Here's a reminder to log in for today's show. So if you do use Facebook a lot, um, give us a like and you'll keep be notified over there. Um, so that'll be wrapping up for today's show. Next week, I hope you join us when we're talking about reading, reading diversely specifically. Uh, the Nebraska Library Association has a diversity committee who um, their members will be talking about some uh, titles they've been reading recently um, about more, more diverse um, topics. So. Um, Alyssa and Angela and Anika and who else is coming? Oh, Laura are all going to be here with us next week to talk about some new diverse titles. So if you're looking for some more interesting um, diverse reading to get into, uh, join us next week for that list of books. And then any of our other shows that we have coming up, we'll talk about health education, OER. Um, uh, in May, we will be joining, just you may have noticed if you are a library person in Nebraska, um, our new state poet has been announced, Matt Mason, for the next uh, five, five year period. We will have him on the show May 15th to talk about um, poetry in, um, in, li in Nebraska libraries. So please do join us for that. All right. Other than that, that does wrap it up for today's show. Um, we did have a 
question here about, oh, um, continuing education credits for attending Encompass Live. Yes, if you are in Nebraska Library, we automatically submit that you attended today um, for the show. If you are not in Nebraska Library, you will receive an email from us um, that is uh, a confirmation that you logged in today with a little certificate that says just that you showed up. You then present that to your state's uh, continuing education people and they can give you the credit for attending today. Um, we in Nebraska cannot issue continuing education or any education credits to other states, but we will give you a little notice that you can then use to apply for that in your own location. All right, and that goes for both our online, our, it goes for our online ones. For our archives, you've got to figure that out yourself. We can't track who's actually accessing our YouTube. Um, talking about ethics today and tracking things, that's interesting. <laughs> All we do in YouTube is track how many people have watched a recording. We don't know who they are or anything, so we can't do anything. So, Here we go, full circle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so that wraps it up for today's show. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for being here with me, Amanda. And hopefully we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.